Welcome to the Reef Resilience webinar, Fishing for Solutions, an introduction to fisheries management for non-fisheries managers with Jeremy Rood, fisheries specialist with the Nature Conservancy. My name is Kristen Mays and I'm the communications manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network and I'll be your host for this webinar, which of course is, is made possible through the support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the 30-minute presentation, followed by an opportunity for additional Q&A online through the Reef Resilience Network Forum, which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and practitioners from around the world. You can use the forum to share resources and connect with other managers or experts. And at the end of the webinar, we'll provide instructions on how you can participate. There are two ways you can ask questions during the question and answer session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we'll keep track of these for at the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session and I'll call on you to ask your question during that time. And a reminder, just you raise your hand by clicking on that small little hand icon on the toolbar just to the left of your name. If you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing any of the slides, please send us a message via the chat box and we'll try and resolve the issue. Before I introduce our presenter, Jeremy, It'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about yourself by answering the following question. Hope you can see it there. Which discipline or what discipline best describes your work? Give you a few seconds to respond to this question and then we'll tally your responses. Okay, looks like most of you are in coral reef management with fisheries management and other falling just behind. So thanks, that's helpful, helpful for us and, and helpful for Jeremy to know who he'll be speaking to. So thanks for participating in that. So we're lucky today to hear from, from Jeremy Rood. Thank you, Jeremy, for presenting. Jeremy is a fisheries specialist with the Conservancy's Global Oceans team, where he supports the global fisheries strategy and fisheries field projects across Asia, the Pacific Islands, South America, the Caribbean, and Africa. His current work focuses on reforming fisheries management through a number of approaches that incorporate science, policy, and market-based solutions. He also has experience assessing the vulnerability of coral reef ecosystems to land use changes and sediment runoff. Jeremy earned his master's degree in coastal marine resource management from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at University of California, Santa Barbara. And he currently lives in Arlington, Virginia. So thank you, Jeremy, welcome. And I'll now pass it over to you to begin your presentation. All right, thank you, Kristen. Um, on behalf of the fisheries team here at the Nature Conservancy, I'd like to thank Reef Resilience for having me here to speak today on this topic, which is on the different components that make up fisheries management and why engaging in fisheries management might actually be beneficial to non-fishery managers as well as fishery managers. Uh, this topic is based around a guidebook that we recently completed and one in which I have been working on for several months. So I'm excited to be able to present to all of you and hopefully engage in some discussion at the end. So those were some very interesting poll results. It, it appears that I, um, I made this example, this example here directly to our audience. Um, in my experience supporting different types of marine conservation initiatives, I have found that people tend to place their work into silos. There is the silo of marine 
um, protection, there's the silo of coral reef management, the silo of coastal protection, the silo of fisheries management, etc. Each of these silos are separated because they have different histories, cultures, ideologies, and, and I get it. Uh, these disciplines are often managed by separate agencies. They may include different stakeholders, and they may even be impacted by different threats. This has led to a separation of marine conservation from fisheries management. And while there is general agreement between the two on what needs to be achieved, the recovery of depleted fish stocks, the reduction of bycatch, the minimization of habitat impacts, they are often addressed in very different ways. But those that are focused on marine conservation are recognizing the need to consider livelihoods and food security in order to achieve conservation goals. And on the other hand, fisheries managers are recognizing that biodiversity and ecosystem dynamics need to be considered in order to achieve fishery goals. So in an attempt to bridge fisheries management and marine conservation, we wrote an entry-level guidebook on fisheries management. And it was designed to help those who are working in marine conservation improve the management of marine resources by providing a broad overview on the different components that collectively make up fisheries management. So this presentation is, is meant to briefly cover the contents of that guidebook in an effort to increase the incorporation of fishery management principles into marine conservation strategies and to help achieve those objectives. It's going to mainly focus on the basics of developing a fishery management plan um, through some examples of case studies. So first of all, what is meant by fisheries management? Well, the goal of fisheries management is to provide immediate benefits to society without compromising the long-term health of fish stocks. And we do this by developing a fishery harvest strategy. And at the, the most simplified level, these six components um, make up a fishery harvest strategy. They are determining the objectives of the fishery, designing a data monitoring program, conducting a stock assessment of harvested species, developing management rules that keep ecosystems and populations healthy, designing enforcement mechanisms that maintain compliance of the management rules within an acceptable range, and finally, it's the evaluation of how these different components are working together to achieve objectives. So let's take a look at the first two components, uh, which I'm going to talk about together, data collection and stock assessment. So collecting and accurately interpreting data is, is fundamental uh, to our understanding of the status of fish species. But even with good data, getting a really clear understanding of the dynamics of a fish population is pretty difficult. Uh, there was once a famous oceanographer named John Shepard who put it like this, counting fish is like counting trees except you can't see them and they move around. So there are two types of fishery data, independent and dependent. And both are needed to gain an understanding of changes occurring in a fishery. Fishery dependent data are obtained from the fishing process itself and are collected through activities like market surveys, port surveys, onboard observers, and others. Fishery independent data are derived separate from fishing activities. We use research surveys to take samples of fish throughout the range to get an unbiased view of the condition of the fishery. So here are just a few examples of data that can be obtained from each. Fishery independent data may provide an index of fish abundance, information on the habitat, and information about size, age, or maturity of the fish. Fishery dependent data may include information on the composition of the catch, um, the weight of the fish caught, and the amount of fishing effort that is used to catch the fish. And these types of fishery dependent and fishery independent data are both used in a stock assessment to detect changes in the condition of fish stocks over time. 
to do this, we use these data as indicators to help us evaluate the performance of the fishery relative to some target that we set. So here are two graphs showing examples of indicators over time to evaluate the performance of a fishery. On the left, the indicator we are looking at is the average length of fish caught over time. And on the right, the indicator we're looking at is the total weight of the fish caught over time. And these horizontal lines are called reference points, which allow us to analyze the relationship between the indicators and the objectives that we have set in our fishery. Uh, the target reference point is where we'd like the indicator to be, and the limit reference point is what we want to avoid falling below. And when an indicator goes above the target or below the uh, limit reference point, that may trigger some type of management response. For example, if the average length of fish caught falls below the limit reference point, let's say this is 20 centimeters, Managers can implement a rule that mandates only catching fish above a certain size, let's say 25 centimeters. So this is a, a very simple example of an assessment. And depending on the type and amount of data that is collected, additional options open up for much more sophisticated analyses and, and models that can tell you things like the population age structure, uh, the estimated fish biomass in the water, and the estimated fishing mortality that is occurring. So why is this helpful? Well, first, fisheries data can be used to help design marine protected area networks and identify coastal areas that may be vulnerable to land-based impacts. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Allison Green, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, recently described in a journal article how data from fishery independent surveys can help determine the home ranges, the spawning migration, and the shifts in habitats used throughout life cycles of key species. And this type of data is a critical component in the design of effective marine reserve networks. Secondly, fisheries data can help understand the impacts of fishing on non-targeted species and habitats which allows conservation managers to minimize or at least compensate for those impacts. And finally, a fisheries monitoring program is likely to increase the capacity for marine conservation in general. Uh, a well-designed and implemented monitoring program that engages fishers and communities can empower them to be advocates for conservation and support educational and outreach programs that raise awareness about the threats to the environment. And we've seen this in all of our field programs around the world. Um, for NGOs and, and government agencies that are often limited with staff and resources, getting buy-in from the community can be the difference between a successful conservation program and one that stalls after a few months or few years. So with so many options for data collection and stock assessments, it, it can be challenging to choose a system that works best for your fishery. And to do this, it may be helpful to ask a number of questions that can help you characterize your fishery. First, what are the main objectives? Uh, are the stakeholders interested in profits, jobs, productivity, biological diversity? This can help you identify what kind of data metrics you'd like to collect in order to monitor your progress on reaching those objectives. Uh, next, what is the governance context of the fishery? Is it a centralized and top-down or decentralized and bottom-up? This allows you to better identify the capacities of different institutions and may assist in assigning different roles and responsibilities when designing a data monitoring system. What are the socioeconomic conditions? At the very least, having an understanding of the total value of the fishery can help you narrow in on some options for data collection and stock assessment. What are the fleet characteristics of the fishery? Um, characteristics like the types of gears used, the locations of the ports, the destined markets of the fish, these things may limit the feasibility of a particular data collection system or stock assessment method. What are the biological characteristics? Some data collection methods will naturally be more appropriate for species with specific life histories. 
And finally, what types of fisheries data do you have available to you now? And uh, by narrowing with each of these six filters, the remaining options for data collection from which to choose will become much more manageable. So let's look at a case study uh, to see where data collection and stock assessment were designed and implemented. Palau is a country in the Pacific Ocean and it boasts some of the world's highest marine biodiversity. But it's threatened uh, by land use changes that increase sedimentation, climate-induced coral bleaching, and overfishing. And between 1996 and 2003, there were more than 30 marine protected areas created, but there was still a general concern that the country's fisheries were continuing to decline, and thus the health of coral reef ecosystems were also declining. And not too far back uh, in 2012, the Nature Conservancy started a project in the northern reef to assess the stock status of the coral reef fishery using very simple stock assessment techniques. Um, we trained fishers to collect data on species ID, uh, length, and maturity for about 2,800 of their own recently caught fish. So in the picture on the left, they're looking at the size and the shape of fish gonads to determine the maturity of the fish. And on the right, they're recording the length and species identification. And using this data combined with some other biological information, we can produce a ratio of spawning potential. And as a general rule, if fish can achieve at least 20% of their natural lifetime spawning, a fishery can sustain itself but less than that and the fishery will decline. And our findings from the study showed that this fishery was achieving only three to 5% of their lifetime spawning and that 60% of the fish that were caught were juveniles. And that trend slowly contributed to the continual decline of the fishery despite the efforts of those 30 marine protected areas. And in a large part because of the results of this study, the government passed legislations last year that greatly improved the management of fisheries in Palau, as well as the design of nationwide protected areas. So the takeaway here is, is that collecting data and conducting a stock assessment provided the mechanism for change that ultimately had a positive impact not only on the coral reef fishery, but marine conservation here in general. So let's take a look at the next component of fishery harvest strategy, and that is harvest control rules. So I just described how data collected from a monitoring program feed into a stock assessment, which evaluates how the fishery is doing by tracking changes in indicators. And the results of that are used to design harvest control rules which involve a set of well-defined management actions implemented in the fishery and the rules that dictate the magnitude of that action. So here are some examples. Uh, a harvest control rule could be the placement of a 50 square kilometer no-take zone in a specific area over a three-year period. It could be a minimum size limit of 40 centimeters. Uh, or it could be the closure of the fishery between, say, June and September. Harvest control rules are implemented in response to changes in those indicators I mentioned earlier with respect to the reference points. For example, a, a management action may first be triggered when a performance indicator falls below a target reference point. It may be adjusted again if the indicator continues to drop and it may require severe adjustments if the indicator falls below the limit reference point. And harvest control rules can produce benefits not only to fisheries, but also to uh, other conservation initiatives and social and economic goals. Uh, some of these are rather straightforward, like increasing the biomass of the fish in the ocean, generating higher fishery revenues, and feeding billions of people around the world. 
So I, I won't get into those here, but if you are interested, I do invite you to read the guidebook to see a little bit more about how that works. I do, however, want to reiterate that communities may find when developed collaboratively, harvest control rules contribute to social cohesion. Uh, a study looking at the outcomes of co-management arrangements found that 85% of co-managed fisheries also demonstrated enhanced unity through increased communication amongst fishers, information sharing, uh, economic trade, that type of stuff. And also, harvest control rules like MPAs and gear restrictions may help to maintain high levels of biodiversity in marine ecosystems such as coral reefs. They can protect critical habitats, things like migration routes, uh, places of refuge against predators, spawning grounds, and nursery areas. And they can also control harvest of keystone species. So where do we start in designing harvest control rules? Well, just like when designing a data collection system, it, it can be helpful to ask a number of questions that characterize your fishery in order to develop harvest control rules that work best in, in your context. So again, what are the main objectives of your fishery? The, the combinations of the economic, social, and ecological objectives will influence the mixture of management actions chosen for a particular fishery. Uh, what is the strength and structure of the governance? Some management actions are likely to be more successful in fisheries with strong government and a strong enforcement capacity, such as catch shares or effort limits. What is the socioeconomic context of the fishery? Gaining an understanding of the cold differences regarding management can definitely help increase compliance from fishers. What are the characteristics of the fleet? Uh, the range of the vessels, the scale of the harvest, the types of gears used, the destined markets of the fish, and other types of characteristics um, of the fishery may help rule out certain actions. What are the life history traits of the targeted species? Um, some biological traits of the main target species, such as growth rates or movement patterns, may be helpful in choosing management actions. And, and finally, um, what are the kinds of fishery data that are available? Certain types of data naturally lend themselves to certain types of management. So narrowing the options for harvest control rules is possible with each of these six filters. Um, I, I do recognize that I just walked through this very briefly and quickly here. So I want to announce that TNC and other partners that we've been working with are actually in the process of building a tool called FishPath that explicitly asks these types of questions and links the answers to a subset of fishery management options given the context of the fishery. And this tool should be available in a few months, so uh, keep an eye out for an announcement um, probably through Reef Resilience. And I would just say that if you'd like help in identifying how to collect fishery data and what kind of stock assessment methods might be available to you, and what kind of harvest control rules are most appropriate, uh, fish path is a, is a good solution and a good starting point. So TNC has this really cool program in Peru that demonstrates the benefits of harvest control rules. Uh, fit, Peru's small scale fisheries, they, they currently operate under an open access regime, a system where fishing is unrestricted and, and basically open to anybody. And very few of the commercial species targeted by small-scale fishers in Peru have effective harvest control rules in place. And fishermen have noted that they're spending more and more time pursuing fewer and smaller fish. And uh, coming up on, I think it's our two-year anniversary, it'll be January in, yeah, two years in January, uh, the Nature Conservancy started working with a fishing community called Ancon. It's a, it's a coastal town located a, a few hours north of the capital city, city of Lima. And in Ancon, there are about 400 artisanal fishers, and they fish in some of the most productive areas of the Humboldt Current, 
but over time they have seen the direct impacts of overfishing. So after doing some data collection and a stock assessment, the fishers imposed a number of their own harvest control rules, including size limits, daily quotas, and spatial closures on some of the islands off of the coast that are key fishing grounds. And so far, the results of this experiment show that the entire ecosystem can recover pretty quickly. Um, after just five months of establishing a closed area within their fishing grounds, the catch per unit of effort by individual fishers increased by as much as 50%. Fishers are, are also getting 25% higher prices for octopus when sold directly to restaurants. And where they used to spend six hours fishing, they are now spending 35 to 45 minutes to reach their quotas. But what is really interesting is that by setting their own harvest control rules, these fishers are gaining attention from the Peruvian government. Um, their, their fishing grounds in Ancon are actually part of a multi-use marine protected area, but in reality it has been nothing more than a paper park. And as the Peruvian government is seeing the benefits of the harvest control rules that the fishers have set for themselves, they have started working with the fishers to make the paper park MPA regulations more legitimate and to establish exclusive access for local fishers to the fishing grounds. So these fishers are now taking an active role in management and influencing the redesign of the surrounding MPAs and the uses within them, which has reduced activities that endanger uh, the marine mammals, seabirds, and, and other threatened species. And some of these fishers in Ancon are now championing this work uh, with other MPA networks in Peru to continue building co-management capacity and, and share some of the lessons learned here. All right, so the last component of the fishery harvest strategy I'm going to talk about today is designing and implementing an effective harvest and compliance system. To manage marine ecosystems and fisheries successfully, we must not only draft relevant regulations, but we must also design and fund effective enforcement systems and foster a, a culture of compliance. Um, the Navy and Coast Guard authorities are usually the primary agencies responsible for marine law enforcement. However, fishery and park agencies that lack training and equipment and probably money are also tasked with fishery enforcement. So there are two basic components of fishery enforcement. The first are the methods and technologies that are used to identify the violators and enforce the regulations. And the second are the mechanisms and approaches that are used to achieve compliance. Um, this graphic here shows just a few surveillance technologies and their respective ranges. Uh, no single technology provides a silver bullet where enforcement is concerned. So enforcement or surveillance systems are often designed using multiple technologies and methods. Now, I don't have enough time to go into each of these, but the guidebook discusses a number of different methods for enforcement and includes the benefits and limitations for each. So here is, is just a screenshot of, of that. And I, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the material that is covered. It's not always the best technologies that should be used, but the most appropriate technology or method given the context. With that said, the most valuable component of every effective program is usually a trained group of rangers or officers who are actively engaged in their enforcement mission. So why is this useful? Um, an effective fisheries enforcement system will not only increase compliance with harvest control rules, but also contribute to marine conservation by identifying and responding to local stressors like land and marine-based pollution, uh, illegal coastal development, and negative impacts associated from tourism. Uh, a fisheries enforcement system that incorporates patrol vessels may also improve maritime safety and the capacity to respond to environmental emergencies 
which provides benefits not only to the fishing industry, but also to tourism, the shipping industry, and offshore oil and gas industries. And again, um, at the community level in particular, developing an enforcement system inclusively with fishers may engage them in the management process, empowering them to help combat threats such as pollution and illegal fishing that impacts their livelihood. So where in the world do you start in designing something as complex as an enforcement system? Um, as I mentioned earlier, enforcement programs are usually run by national agencies or often by a country's navy. So you may be wondering why you need to be concerned with this, and that is a 100% valid concern. Um, but especially in low capacity countries where perhaps the government isn't able to do as good of a job as they um, would like to, it, it can really be helpful to understand how effective enforcement systems are built uh, what the main components are and, and how to influence its development. So uh, with that said, there are three things that are good to consider. The first is, what is the geographical context? Uh, is the size of the fishing area large or small? What's the coastal topography like? Are the main fishing grounds centered around an island where you would have to monitor uh, all of the waters around you, or is this just a very long stretch of coastline that you need to cover? Geography will help uh, determine characteristics of patrol vessels, the surveillance technologies, the communications equipment, and minimum personnel needs. Secondly, what are the characteristics of the fleet? How many fishers are there? Are they well organized, or do they all act independent of each other? Where are the primary ports and fishing routes? These characteristics will help you determine the most appropriate types of technologies to use, as well as when and where to coordinate patrol operations. And finally, what kind of legal framework is in place? Um, is there a vessel registry for the fishery? Are there any special activities that can only be done in certain areas or zones? Are there existing regulations that mandate a certain type of management? Legal information can be used for planning as well as prosecution. So I want to finish the case studies by talking about an example of how a nonprofit played a role in designing and implementing an enforcement system. Uh, this example takes place in Raja Ampat, Indonesia. And here there are a couple hundred traditional subsistence fishers who fish from small vessels using hand lines, as well as other fishers from outside provinces who are in larger vessels and use more destructive fishing methods like dynamite, gill nets, and long lines. And um, over 10 years ago, this was in, in 2005, the Masul Eco Resort came to an agreement with a local community in exchange for the right to build a tourism resort and establish a no-take zone surrounding it. And I think five years after that initial agreement, a, a second no-take zone was established um, nearby around a, a neighboring island. And these no-take zones are patrolled by the local nonprofit that the Masul Eco Resort founded, which employs local community members. And they use a combination of patrol vessels, these satellite base camps on small neighboring islands, um, binoculars, and VHF marine radios. And each of the base camps, base camps have a, a small vessel to carry out these shorter patrols. And the rangers coordinate with two larger patrol vessels and a control center. And after only five years, we have documented a three-fold biomass increase in select species, including sharks, uh, within these no-take zones. And as a whole, the Raja Ampat MPA network has seen a 114% increase in fish biomass between 2009 and 2013, with even higher increases in biomass for key species in these no-take zones. 
Uh, I should also say that the Reef Resilience has hosted an entire webinar on fisheries enforcement. And their website also has a few case studies focused on enforcement. So if this is a topic uh, that you're interested in learning more about, I encourage you to explore these resources. So as I finish uh, this presentation, I just want to briefly look at the goals and objectives of marine conservation and fisheries management. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the goal of fisheries management is to provide immediate benefits to society without compromising the long-term health of stocks. Uh, its objectives may be to maximize productivity of the stock or maximize profits of the fishery or maximize employment opportunities. The goal of marine conservation, however, is somewhat broader, to protect long-term health of all marine species and ecosystems by limiting human-caused damage and restoring degraded marine ecosystems. Its objectives may be to maximize abundance and biodiversity, um, protect a certain amount of habitat type across an ecosystem, or maintain a certain level of ecosystem function. And in between uh, these silos, we have this integrated approach to ocean management that considers the entire ecosystem, including humans, in order to maintain an ecosystem in a healthy, productive, and resilient condition that is capable of providing us humans with the services that we both want and need. And, and it's this type of management that we should all be striving for. So, um, Hopefully some of this information was useful to you and I have convinced at least some of you that integrating these principles of fisheries management can be useful in your strategies for marine conservation. And that concludes my presentation. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Reef Resilience for having me here today and I am happy to take questions. Thanks, Jeremy. That was great, super informative and very interesting, so thank you so much. And I'd, I'd like to now open up the webinar for questions, and please remember you can either send me your question via the question box or raise your hand, and I'll call on you so you can ask your question yourself. And we'll go ahead and leave this slide up so everyone knows where they can access the, the fisheries guide. And if you go to reefresilience.org, um, and click on the fisheries module on the home page. It'll, it'll take you to a link to the guidebook also. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions here to, to go ahead and get us started. And So Jeremy, when designing a data collection program, stock assessment, or harvest control rules, you described asking a bunch of questions to characterize the fishery. That was your, um, what was it, the where to start guide? What do you do with the answers to these questions? So what, what product are they meant to contribute towards? Um, OK, sense? great. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'm happy to get a chance to elaborate uh, a little bit more. So those six categories that I described um, earlier, the, it was the objectives, the governance, structure, socioeconomics, fleet characteristics, biology, and available data. So those things are meant to guide a discussion that is inclusive with all the stakeholders. And this can be through um, a workshop or a series of informal meetings, or it could be over the course of several individual discussions. But once this information or these answers are recorded down, they are meant to help you decide which activities to undertake. and guide the development of something to the effect of an action plan, um, which is essentially a document that just details the steps you are going to take, maybe with some time frames and associated budgets. Hopefully that, that answers. Yeah, very helpful. Thanks. Um, and I know that you said fish path is, is not due out for another couple of months, but can you just tell us a little bit more about that and how it will work? Sure. Um, yeah, and that's a great follow-up question. Um, 
So FishPath is a tool that TNC and its partners have been working on for the last two years to guide decision making in fisheries management. And essentially what it does is ask like a hundred questions from those six categories and then presents uh, you with some options that would be most appropriate for the context of your fishery. And, and this can be helpful for a number of reasons. Um, first, this is a tool uh, it, it, that is able to provide guidance for even the most data limited and capacity limited fisheries. It, it includes stock assessments that require very little data and data monitoring activities that can be done with very little capacity. Um, secondly, it, it helps you make management decisions in a, in a transparent way and being able to show stakeholders exactly how you arrived essentially at a, man, a management action can really help um, gain buy-in, especially if they're inclusive into that process. Um, and then also I would say that it allows you to examine what changes could be made in the fishery in order for other management options to become more favorable or, or more likely to, be, to work. For example, um, right now the best option may be to collect data from fish markets, but if you're either able to increase government capacity or perhaps start a fishery cooperative, um, maybe informal logbooks may become an option that you'd want to look into. So um, yeah, we're, we're still in the process of building this tool, um, but um, I would just say look out for an announcement to be made through Reef Resilience sometime in, in 2017. Excellent. Exciting. Uh, for the Raja Ampat example that you shared, can you tell us how the enforcement system was funded? Do you know that? Um, you know, I am not sure off the top of my head. That's a good question. I believe it was donor funded privately through philanthropic um, organizations, but I'm not totally clear. I do, I do, something tells me also that there were some um, revenues for that went into funding the enforcement of that. But yeah, I'll have to follow up on that and, and let you know. Okay. If that, if, if someone wants to find out more about that, is can we share that information maybe through the, the network forum and just post, post an answer or some additional info there? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to follow up with that on the Reef Resilience Forum, provide some information on that. Excellent. Um, okay, and then with the fishery harvest strategy, you talked about four of the six components in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Do you want to touch on the other two? Um, the, the, sure, yeah. Yeah, so determining the, the other two were uh, determining fishery objectives and evaluating how effective different components um, are and making any necessary adjustments. And those are definitely important pieces. And I only left them out of this talk because I wanted to focus more on the components that are unique to fisheries management. Um, Meeting with stakeholders and defining what your objectives are is a critical part of any conservation strategy. And as I alluded to earlier, they will absolutely guide how you design a fishery harvest strategy and provide a foundation for determining if you are meeting those objectives. Um, and lines, it's, it's always a good idea to regularly evaluate the effectiveness of any conservation strategy and to build in some flexibility for adjusting components as components of the fishery change or objectives change. And um, I believe in the guidebook there are a few resources that I, I point to that will walk through each of these processes in a little bit more detail. Great. 
Um, I see we have a hand up. Liliana, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. If you have a question for Jeremy, you can feel free to ask it directly. Okay, you should be unmuted. Um, I, I was just wondering what happens when um, you don't have enough information like or or data available what do you do in that case um, it, it, it can depend if if you have absolutely no data then your your action might be to start collecting data um, if if there is a little bit of data and perhaps have some um, some local expertise, then there are a number of different um, anecdotal stock assessments that can be undertaken to give you an idea of the likely vulnerability of some ecosystems that um, can tell you something about the fisheries as well. Um, but you would you'd be very surprised in the, in the last 15 years how many very data limited assessments have come up and you you can maybe use some sporadic uh, collection of fish length or um, sporadic catch data to to have some understanding but but yeah if you have absolutely nothing I would say that what you what conclusion you'll probably come to is what is the best way that we can uh, start collecting data now and uh, have some sort of a an assessment of that fishery in just a few short months. Liliana, does that answer your question? Yes, thank or you. begin to address it? <laughs> okay, You're very welcome. Okay, another question just came in, kind of a follow-up. How do you know your data is enough? <laughs> Easy uh, one for you, <laughs> That's that's a funny question because I think like a, a lot of fisheries scientists feel that there there is no such thing as enough. Um, so yeah, um, I I don't I don't know because I feel that when the fishers on the water can tell that the data that is being collected and the management rules that are being implemented. Are, um, are 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 causing um, you know good good fish catches and good fish the sizes, then that's kind of how to um, I don't know ground ground truth it, but but I'd say that you should always be striving to continue improving how you collect data um, given the capacity and and the budget that you have for it. I don't know, it's kind of a trick question. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> I didn't ask it. <laughs> um, okay, thanks, Jeremy. Another question here is, what are the main methods of collecting data? I think that kind Ooh. of gets back to one of your first slides in a sense. But. Yeah. Um, so again, there, there are these independent and dependent methods for data collection. Um, for, for independent data collection, a, a, a lot of what happens is there will be these research trawls that go out and basically um, catch all of the fish that they can and determine, you know, what are the, the length structures um, of little fish versus big fish um, in, in especially coral reef areas. Dive surveys are really popular in, in just going through and, and snorkeling or diving and um, doing abundance surveys or just going underwater and, and looking at what you see. Um, fishery dependent data, there are a number of different things you can do. Um, you can just go to a port where fishers are landing their data or landing their fish and you can measure the size of the fish that they're catching. Um, Another very popular way to collect data is just to keep track of how much the fish fishers are catching 
And if you look at these trends over the course of several years and determine if they're going up or down, that's a, that's a good way to um, have some indication on, on how the stock is, is fluctuating. Um, let's see, what's another one? Um, collecting data on how often or frequent fishers are going out. We call that a fishing effort. Um, so if one year there are 100 fishers and they go out every day and uh, the next year you have 200 fishers and they're going out also every day and you combine that information with say the total catch, you can, you can usually come to some good conclusions of whether that increase in fishing effort is having an effect on the fish population. So those are just a few. Um, there are a whole lot more in this guidebook that are that are more detailed on exactly what they mean and and what um, not only the methods are but what kind of data that you can get from each of them. And I would urge you to check that out. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, a question here. What is the best strategy to follow when the fisheries manager does not have the support of the local government? Hmm. Um, who would the fisher, fishery manager be in this case? Would they be working for a nonprofit or well, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question under that assumption. Um, I, I would say that it might be... He confirmed NGO, sorry, Jeremy. NGO. Okay. Confirmation, okay. NGO. Okay, so there would be two approaches. Um, the first, I would try and engage uh, the fishermen themselves, um, look for a, a local leader or someone that is looked up to in the fishing community and... Um, try and get their support. It can be a little bit easier on a one-on-one -on -one context. And if you can get them to buy into the movement that you're trying to uh, create, having this bottom-up approach and maybe having fishers start collecting their own data and, um, you know, having their own management rules in place without the government's help, like kind of what I described in Peru. Um, that can be one approach to providing some leverage to the government to take notice. Um, another strategy would be to perhaps try and engage the fishing industry. So if there, are, if there is any type of bottleneck where all of this seafood is going through one processor or or one, um, you know, distributor, or exporter, or market even, um, if you can convince them to engage in your fishery strategy, uh, perhaps they'll start mandating that um, fisher, or they, they only buy a certain size of fish, or they start collecting additional data that can inform you what that fish size should be. Um, so those are a few of my suggestions. It, it would be to, to not just engage in the government if, if it doesn't seem like they have the capacity or, are, or with their willingness to, um, to work. Great. Um, and this is in reference to that same Peru example. Have you heard of other fisheries in the world that have done something similar? Um, setting their own harvest control rules. Um, I haven't I haven't heard of fishers themselves setting their own rules, um, like with without the influence of the government. I, I have heard of the the la the latter example that I just gave is um, an NGO working with a processing company and that processing company decided, okay, we're going to start collecting a little bit more information on the fish that comes through us 
And when they did that and they were able to have some understanding of the status of the stock, they then said, okay, we're not going to buy any fish that are, say, you know, below this size limit. Um, and that, that was all done, you know, without having input from the government. But, but yeah, that, that example in Peru is, is pretty unique as far as fisheries that I've come across. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to have to wrap up this question and answer session, but um, our time is, is almost up. We really do encourage you guys to, to continue this conversation on the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum. And we can also post the links to, to relevant resources, such as the case studies and the enforcement webinar that Jeremy mentioned during his presentation. So there are some instructions here. You can go to reefresilience.org, click on the network tab on the top, and log in or join the network forum there. And like I said, the, the questions for, for a few of you that we didn't have time to, to get to today will be posted in this discussion feed. And um, hopefully Jeremy can, can take a look there and get back to us with some responses. And, and feel free to, just to, for the other participants, to, to share some comments there as well. It's meant to be a discussion, not, ne not necessarily just questions. Um, please also send any suggestions for future webinar topics to resilience at tnc.org to our email. And thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Jeremy and congrats on the guidebook. And we really look forward to the launch of Fish Path. Jeremy, do you want to share any last words? We just have two minutes left. Um, I'll just say that for those of you who, who did ask questions, um, if I didn't completely answer them, I'm, I'm happy to follow up, follow up with you uh, individually and, and talk a little bit more about questions you have and, you know, even perhaps come to some solutions. So th thank you very much, um, Kristen, and, and um, yeah, hope to do this again. Excellent. Well, well, thank you all. And the recording of the, let's see, the recording of the world out to, to everyone signed up on the list. If you're not on the list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc.org and feel free to share this information with other managers you think would be interested as well. So, thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Jeremy. My pleasure.